the fear about technological unemployment has been around for a very long time. And here, let me go into some details a bit, because we've been doing uh, some fairly deep studies uh, over the last several years to try and understand exactly what the impact of uh, these technologies on work uh, would actually be. And I should say, by the way, we're not alone in doing this. Uh, many, many others have done similar research. Um, and whether well, it's the OECD, uh, researchers at Stanford and MIT and a few others have done the work. But let me describe what we've done, uh, which is in some ways is analogous to what many have done. So we started by thinking about not so much as jobs in terms of uh, you know, uh, what happens to what's going to happen to a welder or what's going to happen to an accountant, but rather to start with the actual activities. Because if you think about work, uh, the work you do, Wendell, what I do, or any of us do, it typically is a, is, a, um, uh, is a combination of many, many tasks. So we took the task level view. And on that, we looked at something like over 2,000 uh, plus tasks and activities. There's a great data set called the ONET data set and a few others where you can actually understand the constituent activities that make up any occupation. So if, we, if we, we then looked at all those tasks and tried to understand with the potential for technology, how much of that could be automated uh, as these technologies make progress. And what we found having looked at the potential rates of automation along with what those technologies could do, uh, we came to a few uh, conclusions that if you look at the activity level, something like 50% in an economy like the United States, 50% of the constituent activities that make up work could in principle be automated with technologies that have already been observed, to develop today, and are probably on tap to be deployed in the next couple of decades. That's 50% of the activities. And I should emphasize that this is activities, not jobs. Keep in mind again, that jobs are made up of a combination of activities. Now, when you apply this back, to actual occupations. And we did this using the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics data. What you then find is something like, uh, there's only about 10% of occupations that have close to more than 90% of their constituent activities that are automatable. And that's actually important to keep in mind, uh, where these are whole occupations where all the activities could in fact potentially be automated. That's about 10% of them. Uh, there's another 60% uh, uh, of occupations where about a third of their constituent activities can be automated. So what does this all mean? I think where it nets out is something as follows. And we actually wrote about this in one of our reports. We called it jobs gained, jobs lost, and jobs changed. And let me describe each of this. I'll start actually with jobs lost. It is the case that there will be occupations that will decline. Uh, in terms of how many are required, because as automation progresses, we'll have some job declines. That's uh, uh, you know hard to 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 dispute. We're also going to have some jobs gained. Now, you pointed out that throughout the history of technology, one of the things that happens is as technology advances, some the demand for some occupations grow, and the and new other occupations are created. Uh, a good example of this, by the way, historically, is if you look at what happened with um, the bank tellers. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful historical example where if you had looked back in uh, 1970, you might have said, well, with the advent of ATM machines, uh, we're no longer going to need any more bank tellers because it was the case if you had looked at 1970 or thereabouts, that something like the vast majority of the activities that bank tellers actually did was mostly to count your money. Uh, either to take it from you or to give it back to you. And so you would, uh, you would not be wrong to think that, well, if all of, most of that is being done by machines, presumably we're gonna need few bank tellers. Well, what actually happened was between 1970 or thereabouts up until the early 2000s, the number of bank tellers actually grew. Uh, and the reason they grew was because uh, the demand for, uh, for uh, retail banking actually went up and we opened more branch banks and so forth. And, and so the demand for certain activities, even as they change, can actually lead to job gains. So there will be jobs gained, there will be jobs lost, the loss of the jobs changed. The jobs changed as part is quite important because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we found that something like 60% of occupations have some portion, about a third of their activities that can be automated. 
And so as portions of people's activities get automated, the actual, the remainder of what remains changes in terms of what kind of activity it is. Again, the bank teller example is quite illustrative. While the bank teller may have used 80% uh, of their time in 1970 counting money, today they don't do that very much. They actually spend their time doing other things because the occupation itself has changed. So when you put all these pieces together, jobs gained, jobs lost, and jobs changed, do we end up with technological unemployment? Well, we found that at least for the next several decades, the answer is no. In fact, there'll be more jobs created, jobs gained, than there'll be jobs lost. Uh, and that the, the, an important part of what we need to think about are the implications of that still. So if you ask me, Wendell, do I worry about a jobless future over the next uh, several decades? The answer is actually no. Not that we should start, ever stop worrying about that. We should. Uh, but is that at the top of the list? No, it isn't.